Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm glad you could join with us tonight. Uh, still doing our Wednesday night studies online. Uh, but man, it was great to see everybody that uh, got to make it this last Sunday morning for the Sunday morning service at the church. Well, that was such an exciting time. I, I really feel like everyone else uh, enjoyed it, but probably not near as much as I did. Uh, so it was great to see everyone that I got to see. For those that maybe weren't able to make it, uh, we missed you guys, and we look forward to seeing you guys just as soon as you're able to make it for a service. But uh, like we said on Sunday, going through the rest of the month, we will be having our Sunday morning services, 11 o'clock in the sanctuary there at the, at the church. Uh, going into June, we'll start looking at Sunday schools, Sunday night, Wednesday night, that sort of stuff. But for right now, Sunday mornings at the church, and uh, Wednesday night still online and of course we still have our morning minutes uh, going Monday Wednesday and Friday just a devotional thought for you first thing in the morning I usually have those uh, posted usually around 5 30 or 6 uh, there's been a couple times where I've uh, gotten it out up a little bit later around 7 but usually it's early morning so uh, you do still have those to look at too um, but anyway let's go ahead and jump in tonight with a word of prayer dear Heavenly Father thank you for this evening thank you so much for uh, another evening we can study your word together. And again, like I said a moment ago to everyone, I, I, man, this last Sunday, thank you so much for that. Thank you that we could all be in the church together and uh, worshiping and fellowshipping together. It was just an awesome time. Great to see everybody. It just really uh, uh, just was so awesome. And uh, we thank you for that. We continue to pray that everything will continue to go smoothly as things are reopened around our country. And I just pray that you continue to keep everyone safe and those that have been affected with the virus and different things going on. Just pray that you would touch them and heal them soon, Lord. And uh, just pray that you bless our time together tonight as we study your word again and uh, continue our Core 52 series. And we just thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus name. Amen. So from the early days of our study in Core 52, the very beginning, we saw that man uh, chose sin over a relationship with God. Now, even though he was placed in a perfect environment, he was only given one rule, still he chose sin. Now, that's not to say that Adam and Eve, when they sinned, that they were willfully, knowingly choosing sin over God, as in they knew all the consequences because we know they were deceived. But still, that's ultimately what their decision led to, was sin over a relationship with God. And so from way back in Genesis chapter 3, we see man standing in need of redemption restoration and we see him standing in need of forgiveness of sins of a savior of one who would take away his sins and we see a man in need of a word that we're going to talk about tonight and that is atonement and so we see all the way back in genesis chapter 3 the need for atonement so what is atonement well i'm glad you asked because we're going to talk about that tonight and we're going to get into what exactly atonement is and why we need it uh, so we see we're still going to be in the Old Testament tonight. Uh, we're, we're still going to be in the Old Testament. We're about maybe halfway through uh, the Old Testament portion of our study. And uh, we're actually, I was looking at the other day, a little over a quarter of the way through our Core 52 series. And so we're going to be still in the Old Testament. But just in the Old Testament, I want you to think about how much we've seen Jesus. Now, we could step back, and you've probably heard a preacher say this, including myself at different times. The entire Bible is about Jesus. Now, we read the Old Testament, and we never see Jesus' name, but it's about Jesus. It's always pointing towards Jesus. And then in the New Testament, it's Jesus' arrival. And then after he's gone, it's pointing back to Jesus and pointing ahead to his second coming. So the whole Bible is about Jesus. In our time talking through Core 52 in the Old Testament, we've seen the prophecies about Jesus. and We've seen his, his uh, prophecies about his birth, about his death. We've seen him compared to Moses, compared to David. Uh, we've, we've seen uh, prophecies about him being rejected. We've seen so much about Jesus, and we're going to continue that tonight. You see, like I say, we'll still be in the Old Testament, and we're still going to be talking about Jesus. Tonight, we're going to talk about atonement. And again, you can't talk about atonement without talking about Jesus. And also, as far as we're going to talk about Jesus again tonight, you can never go wrong talking about Jesus. 
And so we're going to continue on tonight. We're going to look at a passage we've actually touched on a few times in our series already. When we were in Psalms and we were looking at some prophecy stuff, we jumped over to this passage. It's Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. So a super familiar uh, passage, passage of Scripture. And it's one that's very vivid in its prophetic statements. It's one that when you read it, if you know the story of Jesus, if you know the story of the Bible, when you read this passage, you can't help but see Jesus. And so we're going to read Isaiah 53, and then we're going to talk about atonement for a few minutes. So Isaiah 53 says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to her shears as dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in, the de in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall seed of the travail of his soul shall be satisfied. For his knowledge, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made, when was made intercession for the transgressors. As we talk about uh, atonement tonight, I want us to see just a few quick things about it. First, I want us to see the purpose of atonement, the purpose of atonement. Now, in order to, to discuss the purpose of atonement, it's important that we know what atonement is. Now, atonement is defined as reparation for a wrong or injury, reparation for a wrong or injury. Now, of course, when discussing the Bible, we know that the wrong that is being uh, atoned for is the sin of mankind. In Isaiah 53, as we were reading, I don't know if you saw it, but there were a number of different ways that sin was described. We, we read there about our transgressions. We read about our iniquities. And then, of course, we also read about our sin. And they're all talking about the same thing. And so what is it that we need to be atoned for? What, what reparations need to be made? What wrong needs to be righted? Well, it's our sin. Our sin needs to be paid for is another way to say it. Our, our sin needs to be taken care of, if you would. Uh, our, our sin uh, in the Old Testament, the, the word atonement, in the Old Testament it was the uh, Hebrew word kafar, and it meant to cover, to cover. So atonement in the Old Testament meant to cover. It was to cover sin. And we see this throughout the Old Testament. The purpose of atonement was to cover the sins of mankind until the next time that atonement was to be made. And then after that, another atonement. And we'll see in a moment, it was a sacrifice after a sacrifice after a sacrifice. And we did that. It was, it was a, I say we, but in the Old Testament, they did that. They atoned in that manner because it was pointing ahead towards something else. It wasn't the final, the Old Testament sacrificial system was not the final thing that was going to be done. It was just, it served a purpose and it was looking ahead to one that would come later. And so as we see the purpose of atonement, the definition of atonement, of reparation for a, a wrong, a payment for sin, let's look ahead to the next thing. So that's the purpose of atonement, but let us also look at the picture of atonement, the picture of atonement. The word atonement is used 71 times in the Bible, 71 times, 70 
of the 71 are in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the word atonement is only used one time. And so as we look at the Old Testament, we look at a picture of atonement, a picture of atonement. You see, of those 70 times that atonement is mentioned, 43 of them are in the book of Leviticus. And a large portion of those, when you read atonement in the book of Levit Leviticus, it's in a phrase that says something like this, the priest shall make an atonement for him. The priest shall make an atonement for him. Remember the atonement, a reparation for a wrong, setting a wrong right, you know, payment for something wrong. In our case, we say it's payment for sin, making us right before God. Uh, and, and so uh, if the atonement in the Old Testament, there was a priest would make atonement. What was what was that? Well, this would just this describe when the people would bring a sacrifice to the priest, an offering. As we read through the Old Testament, we see many different places where offerings are mentioned. We see different animals that were used. They would bring, of course, we know about a, a lamb, a sheep. Uh, they would also sometimes bring goats or a turtle dove or, you know, there's different things that they would use for different sacrifices. But what they would do when they would bring this animal to the priest, the priest would kill the animal and he would lay it on the altar and the atonement would be made, this sacrifice, the shedding of blood would cover the sins of the people who were offering that until the next time that an offering was required. You, you see, it, it just covered it. It atoned for, it covered their sins. So it was a way to make them right before God, but again, it didn't take away the sin, it merely covered the sin. And so the, the priest would do that. Now, as I said, this is a picture, a picture of atonement. Because in the Old Testament, the atonement, it was, yes, it was an atonement. As I said, the priest would atone for their sins, but it wasn't the actual final atonement. It was just a picture. It was a foreshadowing of what would come later. It was just an example of, uh, of what an atonement was, but the final, the main, the real, the total atonement was coming later. And this was a picture of that. The priest offering a sacrifice to God on behalf of the people, blood being shed, paying to cover the sin of mankind. It was a picture of what would come in the future. And of course, we know as we look ahead from the Old Testament to the New, what that picture uh, what, what that, that atoning the priest did, what it was a picture of. So we see in the Old Testament a picture of atonement. So there's a purpose. Atonement is a payment or a reparation for wrong or injury, a payment for sin. We see the picture in the Old Testament. The priest would offer these animals for the people to cover their sins, looking ahead to one who would come later to pay for their sins ultimately. And that brings us to our third point. And this is where we'll spend most of our time tonight. The picture or the purpose of atonement, the picture of atonement. But then there's the plan of atonement. You see, God, from way back in Genesis chapter 3, it will, God always knew what would happen. So from eternity past, he had a plan. But we see it taking shape in, in, on earth at the end of Genesis 3 whenever he had to kill an animal to make skins for Adam and Eve, that shedding of blood because of sin started in Genesis 3. Throughout the Old Testament, we see it, but it was never God's plan that the animals would take the place of man. It was always God's plan that a man would take the place of man. For as by man, one man, sin entered into the world, even so by one man, the death of one man, many are made righteous. And we'll see that tonight, the ultimate plan for atoning for our sins was not the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and, and any other animal. The ultimate plan for our atonement can be found in Isaiah 53. You see, as you read Isaiah 53, remember this is still a few hundred years before Christ. But we know, if you're, if you're at all familiar with the Bible, you know the prophecy you read in Isaiah 53 is pointing ahead to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of mankind, the one who would come born of a virgin. He would live a perfect sinless life. He would serve and minister for about three years in a public ministry where he would do many miracles and he would teach many powerful teachings and preach sermons. And then at the end of that, out of jealousy and hatred, the religious rulers of his day would have him crucified. 
but he didn't fight it. He went willingly. He laid down his life. He said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down. He went to the cross and he died. He was buried on the third day. or He was buried in the grave and on the third day he rose. And then some days after that, some 40 days or so after that, he ascended back to the Father where the Bible says he makes intercession for us. That is that picture the priest and the, the animals, they were pointing ahead to Jesus and the sacrifice that he would make, the atonement that he would make. That was the plan. That was the plan of atonement, that Jesus would come and he would die once for all. He would die not to cover sins, but to remove sins. And we'll get to that in a moment. But we see in Isaiah 53, this prophetic passage pointing towards Jesus some 700 or so years before he ever arrived. Now, as you read the words of Isaiah 53, and again, read it again. You know, I just I ran through it real quick at the beginning, but I want you to go back and read through Isaiah 53. Take some time and enter into, accept, acknowledge what exactly is being talked about. It's not just some storybook story. It's not some fairy tale. This is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that it's talking about. And think about, He is bruised for us. He is beaten for us. His stripes, by his stripes we are healed. He is rejected. He is despised. He is mocked. All of that because of your sin and because of mine. And so we see in Isaiah 53 this prophecy uh, about Jesus and what he would do to atone for our sins. And again, he would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He would endure the grief, the sorrow, the the shame, so that he could be an offering for sin, for our sin. I noticed the phrase as I was studying Isaiah 53 that jumped out to me in a different way. You know, I've probably seen it before. Obviously, I've read this passage many times. But tonight, when I was thinking about atonement, this just jumped out at me more. It kind of leapt off the page. And it's in Isaiah 53, 11. It's the first half of that verse. It says this, He, speaking of God the Father, he shall see of the, of the travail of his soul. Okay, so he, God the Father, will see of the travail of his, Jesus Christ's soul. So God the Father will see the suffering of Jesus and shall be satisfied. I want you to think about that. Sat, he, he will be satisfied. I mean, a lot of times when we say we're satisfied, like uh, it's after a meal and, hey, did you get enough to eat? Oh, man, I'm satisfied. I, I got plenty. I, my belly is full now. And we, we talk about that or, or we look around and, and, and what God has blessed us with. You know, it's our home and our family and, and, and we're taken care of. And, man, we're satisfied with what we have. It's a little different here, though, because it says, it says the father saw the suffering of his son and he was satisfied. Again, this just jumped off the page to me as I'm thinking about atonement, making right the sin, a reparation for wrong and injury. It was the wrath of God over the sin of mankind that was satisfied. The suffering of Jesus satisfied the wrath. The suffering of Jesus satisfied the debt that was owed. The suffering of Jesus satisfied the punishment that God was going to have to pour out on mankind for their sin. He looked at His Son being sacrificed. He looked at His Son suffering. He looked at His Son being broken and battered and bruised and beaten. And He looked at Him and the Father was satisfied. Uh, As a father, I, I cannot imagine a scenario where I would see a child of mine suffer And the word satisfied would come to mind. But you see, God loved us so much, He gave us His Son to suffer in our place, to suffer for our sin. He made Him to be sin who knew no sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God. You see, He was satisfied that Jesus was sacrificed. Again, I'm, I'm amazed by that thought. Let's jump over to the New Testament for a moment. Romans chapter 5 verses 10 and 11 say this, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, that He was satisfied so we could be reconciled, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the 
atonement. There's that one time the word atonement is used in the New Testament. You see, we read Isaiah and we say, okay, so Isaiah was saying someday there would be atonement. Someday God's wrath would be satisfied. Someday this will happen. It, it couldn't happen by the, the priest and the blood of animals. That, that did not satisfy the wrath of God. That merely, uh, if we could, and this doesn't do it justice, but merely appeased it for a time. It covered the sin for a time. It, but in Romans 5, we see that it wasn't just a future event. In Romans 5, it had happened. In Romans 5, Paul is writing and he says, hey, we, are, uh, we have atonement because of the death of Jesus. That the reparations have been paid. The payment has been secured. Uh, he took on all of the punishment. He satisfied the debt. He satisfied the wrath of God. God saw his suffering, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and now he's satisfied. We can have forgiveness of sins. We can have life eternal because of this. Now, there's something interesting as I was studying on atonement. And I, I told you, I read the Old Testament and I looked at atonement and it said to cover. One time, it's mentioned in the New Testament, the word atonement. Now, the principle is there throughout the New Testament, but the word is mentioned one time. And in this, in, in, the, in the Greek, the word that's used uh, in the Greek that's translated atonement in the New Testament, it doesn't mean to cover. It means to exchange. Now, maybe that doesn't matter to you. You're like, well, whatever. I don't understand why that's a big deal. Here's the thing. Old Testament, you've sinned. Here's an animal. We'll sacrifice it. That blood will cover you. You're covered until the next time. Think about like insurance. You know, insurance, you, you get insurance coverage. That's, hey, uh, this will take care of you if something happens, but you're going to have to renew again next year. And then you're going to get coverage. And then you're going to, yeah, that's going to cover you in case something happens. And then you're going to have to get it again. Okay. Cover. Now, exchange is different than covering. You see, I, I referenced a verse a, a moment ago, but uh, the Bible tells us that uh, God uh, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that we could be made the righteousness of him, uh, so that we could be made the righteousness of God. We exchanged places. Jesus took on him our sinful nature. He took on our sin on the cross, and in exchange, if we accept Him as our Savior, in exchange, we accept His payment, in exchange, He gives us His righteousness. So it's like we have these dirty, filthy rags on, and Jesus is there in a pure white robe, and He says, hey, let me have those dirty rags, and here's this white robe of my righteousness. I'm going to exchange this with you. It's not just a coverage. It's not just insurance because something may happen. This now is an exchange. You now are righteous and I am made sin for you. That is atonement. We are made righteous because he was made sin. Again, what a, what a wonderful plan of God this was for us. I mean, when you look at it from his standpoint, there was nothing wonderful about it, but for us, we can be redeemed. We can, be, uh, we can have atonement. We can have that exchange where we are made righteous when we accept Jesus. Now remember the picture in the Old Testament that I've talked about. The, the Old Testament, they were just looking ahead to Jesus and His sacrifice. I, I want to read you something from Hebrews. Again, it was a picture looking ahead. The plan was for Jesus to fulfill it. Now look how He fulfilled it. Hebrews chapter number 9. Verses 11 through 14 and then verses 27 and 28 say this. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come. Now i got to stop there. Old Testament, who did the atoning? The priest. The priest would come and atone for the people. The priest would offer the sacrifice for the people. Hebrews says Christ came, Jesus came as a high priest. Okay, But he didn't stop there. Being, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by, are you ready for this? The Old Testament, the priest sacrificed an animal to cover. Jesus in the New Testament is the high priest. So he's come to do the offering, but it's not an animal, no, but by his own blood. Jesus was both the priest and the sacrifice. What the Old Testament pointed towards wasn't a priest who would come and do a sacrifice. 
It wasn't a, a sacrifice that would need a priest. Rather, it was pointing towards Jesus, who was both the priest and the sacrifice, because by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place. And that's that picture of, in the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies, that presence of God where the priest would go in and, and would, would, would uh, offer sacrifice to God on the holy, in the Holy of Holies. And it says here that Jesus entered in one time. This wasn't an annual thing or uh, every few months or a different feast. It says that he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, having made atonement one time for all eternity. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offereth himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hey, if that could cover your sins, if the, if the sacrifice of the priest and the animals could cover your sins, cover the flesh, cover your sins for a while, how much more then could the precious blood of the Son of God do when He died one time and walked boldly into a holiest of place and placed His blood uh, there as a sacrifice for your sins? How much more then does that cover you for all of eternity? And it, that exchange and that purging, that wiping clean your slate so that there's no sin there anymore. Then verse 27, 28. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He died one time. That's all he had to die, one time for everyone's sins. All who will call upon him shall be saved, the Bible teaches us. And he will come again, it says. He will come a second time, and he will not come to die for sin. Rather, he will come to receive his church to himself. So we see the atonement, the suffering that we read of in Isaiah 53, the image there that we see of Jesus Christ coming some 700 and something years later in the New Testament, we see it fulfilled. We see it fulfilled perfectly. That picture of the priest offering the sacrifice was fulfilled in the plan, the fulfilled plan of Jesus coming as both the priest and the sacrifice. He atoned. He made reparations for our sin. He, he paid the penalty. But as I've said many times, Jesus paid it all, but now we have to accept that payment. So what about you? As we read about Jesus paying, this, paying for your sins, and we're all sinners, the Bible tells us, it, when we read about the payment that he made for our sins, look, that payment is no good unless we accept it. Uh, we are still on the hook for our sins unless we accept that Jesus made that payment. Unless we believe that he came, he died, he was buried, he rose again the third day, all to pay for our sins. Unless we receive that, then it's a payment that's been made for nothing. Uh, you know, it's a payment that's out there, and it's just it's this payment saying, hey, somebody claimed this. We have to claim the payment. And so what about you? Have you accepted the atonement that Jesus offered, that Jesus made? Have you been redeemed? Has that wrath of God been satisfied on your behalf? It has been satisfied as far as Jesus is concerned, as far as God is concerned, but now you just have to receive it, the atonement of Jesus. Again, read in Isaiah 53, and it's pointing ahead towards that work that Jesus would do. Let, let's pray, and let's just thank God for this atonement. Lord, thank you so much that you, you loved us so much. You sent your Son to die for us. You sent your son to make atonement for our sins, to make payment for our sins, to be satis to satisfy your wrath and the, the payment, the debt that was owed was satisfied in him, God. We thank you for that. As, as, as difficult as Isaiah 53 is to read and to enter into and to understand of just what Jesus went through, as difficult as it is to read about the anguish that he suffered, God, we thank you for it. Because without that suffering, we could not be redeemed. And Lord, we would not have had atonement made for us. So God, we thank you for that. I pray for each one watching this. If there's any that have never accepted Jesus as their Savior, I pray that they would recognize today He's done it all already. He's paid the debt for them, not just a picture to cover their sins, but rather He's done everything He needed to do to exchange places with them. He, he's done everything to take on their sin and give them His righteousness. All they have to do is receive Him. So Lord, I pray that you would 
work mightily on those hearts and those minds that may be watching of those that may be watching this this evening and just work in their lives that they might recognize their need for a Savior. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, thanks again for being with us tonight. Um, don't forget, this coming Sunday, 11 o'clock, Sunday morning, uh, we'll be at the church. We'll have our morning service. Again, I look forward to seeing you guys. Man, it was so good to get to meet with you all this last Sunday. Uh, I just... I mean, I, I know y'all could probably tell I was a, you know, a little emotional and all and a bit of a basket case, but uh, man, it was so good to have y'all there. Um, and this week, uh, it'll be even better because um, last week it was just, I don't know, I was like so out of sorts. I, I don't know if you could tell that or not, but I just felt so out of sorts all morning because for two months I was looking at nobody and now suddenly there were people and it was just so exciting. And I was just, man, it was overwhelming. So uh, I really look forward to seeing you guys again this Sunday and let's get back into that rhythm, into that routine of being together and fellowshipping and worshiping together. And uh, man, I'm just looking forward to it. And uh, so I'll see you this Sunday at 11 o'clock and uh, we'll have a great time together. You guys have a great rest of the week. I love you and I'll see you Sunday. Take care.